am Dr. Janina Jeff. I am a bioinformatician. Um, and what that means is that, and just shorthand of what that means, is like in this picture, I actually am a scientist that does most of my work computationally. And I'll talk about a little bit of reason of why that is. But my focus is on genetics. And I started to be interested in genetics mostly because people would ask me this central question. And the question that people would ask me, I think someone needs to mute. I hear some, some background noise. Um, the question that people would ask me was, what are you? And, you know, I find it such an interesting question because I think that race as a social construct has become so part of our humanity and who we are that we have this question if we can't categorize people into these predefined races that were randomly created. And so this question of who, what you are, or what are you, um, is really a question that speaks to that, speaking to people trying to find a place to put you into a category based off of physical characteristics that people call race, which is not a real thing. But I really try to study this question in the context of biology and more specifically in the context of genetics. And as I said earlier, I host a podcast called In Those Genes, which is a podcast that uses genetics to help us understand our identities, the histories of our identities, but also the futures of our identities. So I'm going to play a clip from that podcast now. Uh, just because I'm tall and black doesn't mean I'm somehow genetically programmed to play basketball. What do you mix with anyway? Are you Spanish? You from Africa? Like where? Where are you from? You feel good. My hair curly because I got Indian in my family. What the baby? What you mean? That's just a small snippet of some of the questions and things that we hear in the black community when people ask, what are you? It's either associated with your skin color or associated with your hair. But really, the answer to this question is very simple. And it's something that we all can have the same answer to. And the answer is, we are all human. So we are human. And by definition, that means that we are 99.9% .9 the same. In fact, there's only 0.1% that makes us different. And that 0.1% that makes us different is exactly what I have done through my, through my career and what I have used in my career. So in the pilot episode of the podcast, we explore this question, what is the genome? And as I said earlier, I'm a geneticist. So what I do is I study that 0.1% that makes us different that is comprised of our entire genomes, which by definition, all of us share 99.9% .9 of our genomes. But what is the genome? Yeah, um, yeah, you need to back up, um, uh, Janina, two sentences, because you were inadvertently muted. Oh, okay. Apologies. Thank you. Um, what I was saying is that being a geneticist, I study the point one. well, I study the genome. And like I said, by definition, since we are all human, there's only, there's 99% of the genome that we share. There's only 0.1% that makes us different. But you're probably wondering, well, what is what is a genome, Janina? What is a genome? And so in the pilot episode of the podcast, which is this is a picture of me, um, the baby is me, and my parents, I talk about exactly what a genome is. So let's listen. And genes are what make us us. So everybody has the same genes. As much as we try to think one person has a gene for this and the other person has a gene for that, we all have the same 25,000 genes. <laughs> But what makes it different are the four letters that make up these genes, and that's called DNA. So those four letters, or these four chemicals, are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And for short, we call them A, T, C, and G. And so the sequence of these letters is what makes one gene different from the next gene. And within the same gene, you can have a different sequence between different individuals. So I told you guys we're 99% the same, so we have the same genes, but some of our genes may have an A where someone else has a T. 
And that's what makes us different from each other. Now, genome is a term that refers to your entire gene pool. Now we're talking about all 25,000 genes. We use it as a cohesive term to distinguish it from talking about a particular gene per se. For the sake of explanation, think about your genome as a bowl of rice. The entire bowl is your genome and every spoonful are your individual genes. So we know each bowl of rice has 25,000 spoonfuls or genes. Okay. So hopefully you enjoyed that. And for those of you, I know you guys are mostly in high school, um, but in those genes, it's a play upon words from an R&B song by an artist named Genuine in the 90s. Uh, and so we play it upon words and spell it G-E-N-E-S, referring to the genes that I just taught you about. And I told you humans are 99.9% .9 the same, but we do share some differences with other species. And I think it's really important that we talk about this. So this is another picture of me as I'm the human representative here. And what I'm showing you is how closely related we are to other types of organisms. So you may know already that our closest cousin in terms of mammals is a chimpanzee. We share 98% of our genomes with a chimpanzee. Another mammal that we share a large amount of our genomes with is a mouse. Now, the reason why I want to show you this is because that 8% difference between me and a mouse really makes up a lot of things. I mean, I look quite different from a mouse. I do daily activities that are quite different from a mouse, as well as a chimpanzee. And so these differences really do make up a lot of things that distinguish us from each other. But these things also have been socialized to create barriers. For example, when people say that there are different races and that these different races explain differences in who we are as people, that some scientists long, long time ago used to say that different races were different species or subspecies. And in fact, we scientifically know that not to be true because in order for you to be a subspecies, humans don't actually fall within that realm. If that were the case, we wouldn't be able to mate for different races if race was a thing. And we wouldn't share so much of our genomes. I mean, we could argue, though, that we're quite different from a plant where we only share about 18%. In fact, I just did a podcast and I talked about how humans are genetically similar to bananas. Can you believe that we share 50% of our genomes with a banana? Okay, so just to show you how complex the genome is, genomes are, are very, very complex. We share a lot of our genomes with everyone else, and we are all human. And so I call myself a geneticist because I study these differences all the time. And the reason why I say I'm a geneticist is because as a scientist, I really do understand the technical parts about genetics. I study it as a field. I got a PhD in genetics after I finished my undergraduate degree in biology. But as a Black woman, I'm also conscious of this socialized thing called race that have caused so many problems when we talk about medicine, when we talk about science, when we talk about the lack of diversity in medical research, and more specifically, the lack of diversity in careers in science, I know that it comes from other bigger, bigger systems of oppression that are part of our society, unfortunately. So I consider myself a geneticist, someone who understands the power of the genome and how it impacts the future of human health, but also someone who is conscious of the lack of ethical research and compassion for people, particularly those of non-white communities or African descended communities. And what I'm most passionate about is how I can create solutions to change this paradigm. One good example of how I kind of define this geneticist thing is using Henrietta Lacks. I'll tell you a little bit about Henrietta Lacks in a second, but when I was in college, I had heard of these things called HeLa cells. And HeLa cells are the cells that you see on the left side. And these HeLa cells are used in almost every cell biology lab, particularly because they can proliferate or replicate on their own. They're cancerous cells. And they're named HeLa cells, I didn't know this at the time, after Henrietta Lacks. And Henrietta Lacks, I like to call her the original geneticist. 
And like I said, this complicated, you know, dual personality of me dealing with being a black woman, but also understanding science is also a part of Henrietta's story. So Henrietta Lacks was a woman who I say is the original geneticist because if it wasn't for Henrietta Lacks, we wouldn't even know how many chromosomes we would have. We wouldn't even have been able to sequence the human genome. We wouldn't even be able to build, build some of the first vaccines that have ever reached the, the country. And so I'm going to play another clip from the podcast that tells you a little bit about Henrietta Lacks' story. So this is both a science talk, but also a Black history talk. It was 1951 in Baltimore, Maryland. A young woman, Henrietta, was experiencing severe vaginal bleeding. Trusting the only facility at that time that treated poor African Americans, she went to John Hopkins Hospital, desperate to stop bleeding. In addition to providing care for Mrs. Lax, the physician noticed something about her cells. They didn't die. Instead of getting her consent to study the cause of her immortal cells, he decided to steal them without her consent. The only credit he gave her was naming the cells an abbreviated version of her name, HeLa cells. Today, this is the most common human cell line that exists in research labs. Her cells are in part responsible for the eradication of polio, creating HPV vaccines, sequencing the human genome, and understanding diseases like cancer, HIV, and so much more. Mrs. Lax died at 31. And it isn't until recently that the story on the misuse of her data has come to light. And while her family has been compensated with some money, Mrs. Lax didn't have the option or privilege to consent to the use of her data. But we do. We have the privilege to consent. Many of us have the privilege to read and the privilege to research and use powerful tools like the internet to understand these T's and C's. And many of us have the ability to help out those in our community who can read and research. We've experienced a long history of having things done to us without our say. And while institutional BS still inflicts oppression on us day in and day out, I want us to at least be able to arm ourselves with the tools to become authors of our own stories. Don't let companies do things with your genome without your true consent. Read them T's and C's, fam. So that's an excerpt from the podcast. And in that particular episode, I'm referring to T's and C's, which are terms and conditions. If any of you have ever done anything on the internet, you download an app, you consent to something and you give your electronic consent, they always ask you, have you read the terms and conditions? And in this particular episode, I'm talking about companies that ask for DNA for people and getting their consent. And I wanted to mention consent because particularly, like I said, that ethical divide of being a scientist, but also being a black woman is most prominent with Henrietta's story. Sorry, let me pause that. I don't know why it's playing it again. Uh, so like I said, Henrietta Lacks is a black woman who contributed to science. So I call her the original geneticist. But the problem is, is that she contributed to science without her consent. Um, we are grateful for the scientific contribution that Henrietta Lacks unconsented gave the world because without it, we wouldn't know a lot of things about genetics. We wouldn't even be able to create some of the early vaccines. But again, it is important to realize that in a lot of the ways that we grow in these STEM fields, we're learning things about the unethical practices that happened to our ancestors before us. And so I call myself a geneticist. Now, you might be asking, like, what does a geneticist do? Uh, you told us about the genome. You told us about Henrietta Lacks. But, like, what do you do do? And you might remember also in the beginning when I played a clip from the podcast and I asked you or I told you what a genome was, I mentioned this thing called DNA. And DNA is comprised of four chemicals or compounds um, called nucleotides, and they really just represent four letters. I also told you in the beginning that the reason why this picture is like this is because I work from home. I actually work on a computer. I have a master's in applied statistics. And so a lot of the things that I do are not in the traditional lab where I'm pipetting, but are really done at um, really done at the computer level. And that's because when we talk about DNA and DNA being comprised of these four chemicals, A, T, C, and G, we can translate it to data and I can study that data. 
More specifically, because of my cultural connection and my interest, I focus on population genetics. And what that means is that I look at different populations that have different genetic backgrounds. Now, I'm very careful. I don't like to use the word race because race is not a thing. Race is something that is not anything a part of science. It's not a scientific concept. It's just a social construct. But one thing we can talk about is the, the genetic architecture or differences between people who share a common environment. And that's what we study in, as population geneticists. We study groups of people who've lived together for a long period of time. Think about people who have a shared common ancestor from the continent of Africa or a shared common ancestor who's indigenous to America. These people share a common uh, environment. And because they share a common environment, some of their genetics might be more closely related to each other than others. And so these four letters that make up DNA, A, T, C, and G, is what I study. And so if we were to look at these three beautiful women and we look at their DNA, I told you we're 99.9% .9 the same. There's only one little thing that makes us different. And that one little thing that makes us different is what I've made a career out of. They're called single nucleotide polymorphisms. And what they basically are saying is that in this thing called DNA, where we have these four letters, where we see differences, we call it a polymorphism. And we call it a polymorphism if the difference is observed at a population level. Again, a population is just a group of people who share the same environment and a group of people who have a shared common ancestor. And so I study the relationship between the single nucleotide polymorphisms or these differences in that 0.1% that make us different and see if there's a connection with disease. Is there a connection with um, is there a connection with things that make up things that are unique to our culture? Are there any connections there? And how can we disentangle what's genetic, what's social, and what's likely a little bit of both? In addition to that, as a population geneticist, I also do a lot of uh, community work, like speaking to you today. I really like mentoring students. I really want to make sure that the next generation of scientists are doing the same things and really even pushing beyond what we use as genetics and thinking about the future. And so in addition to science, uh, in addition to being a population geneticist, I'm also a science communicator. Like I said, I have a PhD in population genetics and I am the host and executive producer of the podcast. In my previous life, I worked as an academic where I have over 40 peer reviewed publications. Basically what that means is all of the things that I found as a scientist, I wrote nice little articles about them and other scientists reviewed them and gave critiques. And now this is something like we like to say in science is accredited work. I also consider myself a STEAM activist. What that means is that not only do I encourage students to be involved in science, technology, engineering, and math, I also really emphasize how important the arts are and a part of that. And the reason why I say that is because the podcast is not your traditional science career right? But it is an artistic uh, career. And I do think that the strongest scientists that we've ever seen typically have a creative side and typically are artists themselves because scientists have to think about experiments. Scientists have to think about creative ways to think about facts and theories. And so I really like to encourage people to be STEAM activists. I'm um, also a hip hop enthusiast. If you listen to the podcast, it's filled with a lot of hip hop, a lot of music to keep you entertained. I believe that teaching science and learning genetics should not be something that's boring. I think that it should not be something that is, you know, within the confinement of Eurocentric language. It should be culturally relevant and inclusive. And so I do a lot of work on that end. But I think one of the things I really want to talk to you guys about today is how did I get here? And the short answer to that question is that I had a village, I had a community of people, like all of the community of people that are on this call today and all of the people who work with you to make sure that you have the support you need to be successful. But this journey really started in high school. Um, I am from New Orleans, Louisiana. I went to a historically black high school in New Orleans, just like a lot of places in the South, there was a lot of segregation. And in the late 19th century, and early 20th century, black students were not allowed to go to school with white students. And so I say it's a historically black high school because the school that I went to was actually the first 
high school for African Americans in the city of New Orleans. Um, after I wanted to go to Spelman College, which is a historically black college or university. And particularly I wanted to go to Spelman because I had an aunt who went to Spelman and I had a dad who went to the brother school Morehouse. And most importantly, Spelman was really, really, really focused on creating a curriculum that was made for black women. Now, like I said, one of the things that's most important about having these kind of conversations is to not just talk about like, okay, well, I went to Spelman and then I went to Vanderbilt and all these great, amazing things happen. I want to talk about the details. I want to talk about the granular things that you're probably going to be thinking about in the next couple of months or years as you start to apply for college. One of those things that were a barrier in my you know, personal development were standardized tests. I was a straight A student. I had, you know, I used to compete in science fairs all the time. I really, really love science, but I was not trained on how to take standardized tests. And now that we know about standardized tests, which is a whole other conversation. There are a lot of barriers in place, particularly for minority students. And so I didn't have the best standardized test scores. Like I, I didn't know anything about them. I was, I was okay. I was average. But one thing I did know is that I had a group of mentors and supporters who helped me think about how I can cultivate my college application in other ways, and also how I can learn to be a good standardized test taker, which I had to grow into as I matriculated throughout my career. But nonetheless, I put together a great, amazing application with the help of family, with the help of mentors, like the mentors who are mentoring you and everyone on this call, with that community support. I was able to do that, and I was able to accomplish my dream of graduating from high school and eventually going to Spelman College. Now, here's another barrier, right? We talk about college, and for a long time, college were for people who were the elite. These were for people who had money. These were not for minority students who didn't have money. And when I went to Spelman, I was like, well, how am I going to pay for Spelman? Because Spelman costs so much money. How am I going to pay for Spelman? Um, and so how am I going to pay for Spelman? The summer before I went to Spelman, I, again, utilized my village. So really people who I came in contact with, if they knew anything about scholarships, if they had already gone through the experience, I called them up. I called them up. I called everyone and said, Hey, how can I pay for this? Like, I have this dream. I have to go to Spelman. I need it to be paid for. Um, can you help me? My family doesn't have the funds in order to get me there. And like I said, my village really, really came through. And what happened was I actually applied for a lot of scholarships, a whole lot of scholarships. I mean, I spent the whole summer working because, again, I didn't come from a rich family. So I always had a job. Even when I was at Spelman, I was always working. But I applied for a lot of scholarships. And it turned out that there were a lot of these little scholarships that added up. So as, as this happened, I actually was able to go to Spelman and I was able to go to Spelman without having any additional student loans, which I know is a huge privilege. And I know that's not everyone's story, but I do want to emphasize here that there are a lot of opportunities. And when you have the right support system and you have the right group and village to support you, you can make this happen. And this is a very feasible thing. And so I was really grateful to attend Spelman without any type of loans and things like that and pay for my college education that I did not take for granted. And so going back to this question, what are you? Well, at this point, I had officially become a Spelmanite. I had graduated from Spelman. I really enjoyed my experience there. And it was time to move on to my next step. So my next step was I'm going to be a doctor. When I finished um, high school, my parents were pregnant. So I have a younger brother and then I have a younger sister who's 18 years younger than me. And she was on the way. And I said, well, my mother was older. I said, I want to be an OBGYN. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be a medical doctor. And then I saw a picture of, cadaver, of a cadaver. And while I had a biology major and I had, you know, decent grades, I realized that I don't think I actually want to deal with blood. I don't think I actually need to be in the clinic, but I do still want to be connected to science. And so I went ahead and said, I'm going to go to graduate school. So at this point, I'm, you know, officially a Spelman woman. I have a biology, a BS in biology, a uh, bachelor's in biology, and I'm starting to apply 
or graduate school and I'm doing all this application and I'm just getting rejected left and right. And I'm like, well, why am I getting rejected? And I just want to also be very honest that a lot of my story does have, you know, like it's, it wasn't all flowers and roses. I, you know, got rejected. Like I said, I didn't do well on my standardized tests originally, but this is all a part of my story and this all makes my story more unique. And so while these things were happening, I didn't get into the schools that I wanted to. And I was like, well, maybe I should take a year off. Maybe I should go and work. And then I called up my mentors and said, hey, guys, you know, I like science. You guys know I like science. I've been working in the labs while I was at Spelman while also having a job to help pay for, you know, my livelihood and all these things. Can you help me out? And they came together and they said, actually, you should apply for this program at Vanderbilt. I think you would be good for it. And I applied for it and I got in. And so now I'm on my way to Vanderbilt. Now, while I was at Vanderbilt, I also incurred, you know, I also had a lot of things happening. Uh, and I don't know if some of these terms are new to you, but I'll explain them. So one of the things I dealt with the most was imposter syndrome. You know, having gone to black schools my entire career, I had never been to a school with predominantly white students, like 99%. I was actually the first black student at Vanderbilt in this program. And imposter syndrome is just this idea that, you think that like, okay, when are they gonna notice that I'm not supposed to be here? Like, why do they let me in? And I dealt with that. And that had to deal with, you know, my own issues and insecurities that I felt as being a black person um, in an all white school. I thought, well, maybe, well, all the white kids are, are better than me. Maybe they're smarter than me, you know? And it didn't help that like I had, when you're getting a PhD, you do these qualifying exams. The first time I had taken the qualifying exam, I had failed. And it was in this experience at Vanderbilt that I realized that being successful is not just tied to what you know. A lot of the things that I was dealing with were around my, around mental issues, around mental health. And so I started going to therapy. I started learning about imposter syndrome. I started to rebuild my confidence and realizing that a lot of the fear and a lot of the things that were happening and the anxiety that I was experiencing were all a result of mental health issues that I was dealing with as a result of the environment, of course, living and being in a world where being a Black woman was not exactly praised or supported or was something that I was used to seeing. And as such, you know, thinking about how can I survive? How can I be in this experience and make sure that I am successful? I thought I had to assimilate. I had to be someone that wasn't as Black as my authentic self who grew up in New Orleans. And so I had to do code switching. Code switching means that, you know, I changed the way I talk to sound presentable to another group of people because I think that my authentic way of talking or my authentic way of being would not be accepted in that space. And now that I'm older, I have these words. I didn't have the words for these things then, but I dealt with all these things. And if I hadn't dealt with all these things, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I hope that you don't have to deal with these things. You should never have to code switch to go to college. You should never have to code switch to be a scientist. And I hope you don't have to deal with imposter syndrome or any type of anti-Blackness that could have you know, impacted you. But one thing that I learned that I wasn't the only one who dealt with these issues. I also learned that I could get help. I could go back to that support system, like all the people who are on this call here for you today, showing up on a Saturday. I can go back to those people because they are my cheerleaders. They'll reinforce to me that I am good enough. They'll reinforce to me that I can talk and be my authentic self. And so that experience really shaped a lot of my career. But I finished. I finished. So there is a happy ending. I did, you know, go to Vanderbilt. I finished. I got my PhD in human genetics and also got a master's in applied statistics and now work as a full-time scientist at a company called Illumina as a bioinformatician. So I already told you I'm a scientist that uses computer science and statistics to understand complex questions related to biology, particularly how those little differences in our DNA make up who we are. And the company that I work for, we create genetic tests, the one that I'm holding in this picture, that companies like 23andMe and Ancestry DNA use. But one thing I will say, as you grow in your career, one thing that's extremely important to me is that all those people who brought me to where I am, all those people who helped me through my journey, I want to do the same for the next generation. And that next generation, that's you. That's who I'm talking about. And so I now 
tailor my career outside of my professional science career to also include some community advocacy work. And so I say I'm always tailoring my career just like people tailor their DNA. And I am really passionate for creating a village for the next generation of scientists like yourselves, for those people who don't have a village, because I didn't always have a village. I had to build one. And I'm here to say that I, and I'm sure very, a lot of your mentors on this call are here to be the village for you. And so in doing that work, I have been able to, you know, explore my passion projects, be able to create the things that I'm interested in creatively, like the podcast, with the things that I'm interested in professionally, like science. And doing so, I do a lot of speaking engagement, I do a lot of mentorship, and I like to focus everything that I do on science, science communication, and science inclusivity. And so... Like I said, the thing that's most important to me is that we can use science communication, we can use culture, we can use language to change the field of science, to change the field of genetics, to make sure that everyone understands the value that lies within our genome beyond just the little things that make us different, but like what are the things that we can use in our genome that empower our futures? Because when we talk about minority populations, when we talk about non-white populations, we don't often talk about the future. And it's really important that we use science communication as a tool and community advocacy as a tool to talk about our futures. Our futures and talking about our futures should be something that's normalized. And so with that, I want to leave you with one more thing. We talk about this central question, what are you? And now I want to play a clip on how you can think about what you are in the context of your genome, empowering you to use it for your future. In every part of your DNA, you have this wealth of information. It is your duty to learn about it, protect it, and use it for good to create a generational well of knowledge about your identity. See, here in the lab, we want to create a community that not only knows about the beauty and the resilience of the genome, but a community that is knowledgeable about how the genome defines our identity. Your genome is invaluable. <laughs> So thank you guys so oh, DNA, sorry sorry <laughs> thank you guys so much i want to officially welcome you to our family of listeners of the podcast i'm going to play one last clip that just gives you an introduction of what the podcast is and what it's about and then i'll end with my contact information please feel free to reach out to me. Please, please, please subscribe for the podcast. Become a listener. I guarantee you're going to learn so much about yourself and so much about genetics. I hope that you'd be inspired to become a geneticist or think about what it is that you like to do that can contribute to this community of promoting our futures. Welcome to In Those Genes, a science and culture podcast that uses genetics to decode the lost identities of African descendants through the lens of Black culture, hosted by me, Together, we will learn, laugh, and make genetics ours. Every week, I will break down complex genetic concepts to help us understand who we are through Black culture. An admixed genome from African Americans looks like a bowl of jambalaya, jollof, paella. Plus, we'll be having kitchen table discussions with kindred spirits who you'll meet along the way. So we come from a, a group of people who all send their daughters to <laughs> this We'll address questions and concerns that exist within the Black community around genetics. I mean, you see the commercials and the lady pops on there. I'm 60% this and I'm 70% that. How valid is the result? This entire experience is dedicated to us. Not scientists that typically exclude us, the companies that target us, or podcasts that erase us. My English name is Dean Calvani, which is a Swahili name. It's a, a freedom. Black don't crack. Africans are more diverse than the human population is. Hard fact. And a hard, hard fact, fact, full pause. And we'll always leave you with an affirmation. In every part of your DNA, you have this wealth of information. It is your duty to learn about it, protect it, and use it for good to create a generational well of knowledge about your identity. And that's how we plan to get in them genes. Okay, so you've heard probably more than of the podcast <laughs> than you'd like to, but thank you so much for having me today. It's really great to talk to you and, and be connected with you. So thank you.